Welcome back to Love, Life, and Legacy, the podcast dedicated to helping you never get these hypersexualized times. Andrew Love here, and today I am Benji Free. This episode is Benji Free. We have a special guest known as Gene Honeycutt to you and to everybody, actually, because that's just his name. And he was on the podcast probably three years ago. I've recommended several people listen to his episode. He unpacked his journey with SSA and he now just had his second kid. And it's so cool to meet somebody like him with a story of like, he's really unpacked and understood his story and where his feelings come from, understanding his healthy emotions and his healthy, healthy longings, but also unpacking and understanding his trauma and how they impacted his life. So this episode really gets into lust. And the cool part about lust is that typically we're just caught up in the swell of lust, like the wave, and we just surf that wave towards our own demise, right? Towards porn, towards just acting out. But what if you could understand what's behind that lust? And it could be as simple as gene unpacks as a desire to want to be young and free and roam wild in the forest, and yet it gets transmuted into this dysfunction by wanting to seek out a particular type of pornography. So I think this is a super impactful episode because it helps you see the man behind the curtains, this thing that controls our actions, the emotions behind the emotion. So if you'd like to understand yourself, by golly gosh, please listen to this. Take notes in your heart at least, if not on paper. Or do people still take notes on paper? Take notes in your digital computing device. Whatever the case may be, let's get into it. All right, so we're back with, I don't know, is this your, I think this is your third time back, Gene. Is this, is that true? Is this fake news? Is this real? Uh, Second, second. Uh, You sure? Yeah, Okay. we did one other podcast. I I did have a mention. I got mentioned in someone else's podcast, but that's it. Yeah, good. So in, in, in essence, this is your second time in mention. It's probably like your fifth time. Cause I've Googled or not Googled. I've, I've searched your name in our website and it comes up quite a bit. So we talk about you a lot oh, was that in right? a good way, in a good way. Yeah. No oh. gossip promise. Yeah, I'm flattered. Um, oh. <laughs> but we are, so we're starting to work more with Gene. And if you know, you know, and you'll find out more about that if you need, but Basically, we're collaborating with Gene because he's he's one of us for sure. And he has diverted the major- all of his professional attention onto helping people. And he's got a lot of great insights because now this is his world um, that mm. he just, you're steeped in it, right? So, Right, um, right. Well, do you want to talk about that? So you were a school teacher. You and I had a just a private conversation about act in academy because i was obsessed with it mm-hmm. i i helped right. Right. to get one started in denver and then all of a sudden you were going to be a teacher in one so your your vocational trajectory was very clear you're going to be a teacher and then all of a sudden uh-huh, right. you took either a sharp left turn or maybe it's a u-turn or i don't know which direction but you deviated <laughs> right. from the chosen path so what what happened um, yeah, so I, I was really interested in starting a school. Um, and that was my, that was like my end goal. Um, and well, I, I was, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny because, uh, my story is same sex attraction and it was like such a big story. And so it's always like same sex attraction, same sex attraction. And then I finally got to this point in my life where it really wasn't my story anymore primarily like i got married and i was became obsessed with my wife and you know, we have kids <laughs> now and uh-huh. it, it was almost like a relief because like i don't i don't have to be so immersed in like same-sex attraction is is all you think of when you think of gene honeycutt um <laughs> and so it's kind of funny for me to be doing what i'm doing now um yeah. <laughs> um but i feel i feel like it's so i I started out by saying it's my neglected calling, meaning that I felt called to, to Mm -hmm. endeavor in this area, 
but also didn't want to do it. Um, and I think that's because if I look at like my entire life, starting from elementary school, uh, starting even before elementary school, but you know, all through my schooling, I was always very quiet. I, people didn't know what my voice sounded like. Um, and so <laughs> my main way of interacting with people is pleasing and appeasing. And I'd even lie to people like uh, coworkers, they'd, they'd start rambling on about something and I'd, I would be not interested at all, but I'd pretend and nod and smile and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And say exactly what I knew they'd like for me to say. And then I felt terrible because I'm like lying um, and pretending like I'm interested when I'm not. Um, and, uh, but that's my, as that's you my say that, to please and I wonder how many be agreeable. Okay. I, I was just thinking about how many times have you done that with me or with the high noon staff <laughs> where you pretended to be interested in what we had to say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't, don't get insecure, Andrew. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but it's it's funny for me to look at where I am now because when I look at my story, my story is inherently offensive. Um, no matter what which way I I would turn with it, it's it's going to be an offensive story. And so mm. I feel like I've been given aff an offensive story and a very mm. agreeable personality. So it's it seems almost contradictory. But I really feel like this is where I need to be. This is where. Uh, my voice really needs to come out where it's been stifled for so long. Um, so it does feel like a calling, like like my path, my journey, everything I've been through is is bringing me here. So at this time in my life, this is where I feel really called to be uh, in this area of same-sex attraction and uh, lust and getting sexuality and sex right. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. It, I think... Every Canadian listening knows exactly who you are, especially every church member, that they are involved with something controversial by proximity, but are naturally an agreeable person and don't right, want to cause right, a fuss, right. right? I definitely know the right, feeling. Right. I definitely know it. So uh, you just felt like the calling was always there, but the timing wasn't right until recently, and now you just acquiesced right. to what needs to happen. Yeah, I feel like the timing is right. Um, and part of it, uh, to be frank, is that I, I wanted, I guess I was getting jealous of everyone who's working from home. Um, and I knew <laughs> I did not want to teach from home or do any sort yeah. of schooling from home, um, like schooling other children. Um, so um, it just seemed like the right timing when, you know, we, we got pregnant with our second kid. And it seemed like, yeah, I would love to be around home more, which is actually the opposite of what I grew up in. My dad was always gone. Um, and so now I feel like called to be very around and in my kids' lives um, and to support my, support my wife. So we're just, we're just fully entrepreneurial and we juggle the kids and she, my wife does her businesses. I do mine. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's working. It, it's, uh, it's quite scary, uh, to be honest. Um, but, um, it, you know, we're, we're kind of, it's kind of our leap of faith and, um, it, it pushed me. It was that final push to say, you know, we can switch careers and do something that is very meaningful to me. And it is, mm. um, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it on the, the side, supporting men, for for i think seven years um but now i want to like really dedicate my energy towards it yeah it's a great thing i mean it's a great thing for society that we now have a gene honeycutt um fully enrolled in this process of helping others so um gene is becoming a well you already are a coach but you're becoming specialized in sexuality, healthy sexuality, and helping men with SSA, but also just helping people, I mean, men and women with with various things or just men? Uh, just men. Um, I, just although men. I have okay. coached some women, but that that's not, uh, that was more, you know, it was a Life different coaching. project. Uh, so sure. 
Um, yeah, it, yeah, and it was, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I do uh, sex, sex addiction recovery primarily. Yeah, so that's where this gets juicy, everybody, because uh, when I was asking Gene about what he would like to talk about, something that's really on his mind, he brought up the topic of lust. And recently we were on a call because High Noon right. is going to be collaborating a lot with Gene. And he brought up the topic of lust. And I realized that it's a very important topic that we haven't really focused on enough and understood enough. So I really want to unpack that for all of you listening and for myself because um, lust has infiltrated almost every aspect of our lives, right? And it's uh, lusting mm -hmm. for stuff isn't necessarily inherently bad, but in the way that it's normally experienced, it's typically unhealthy, right? Um, that it, it, like people have associated food with sex and all sorts of things. They've mashed all of their experiences together and it's hard to sort through what's healthy and what's not. And lust is a big part of that uh, hodgepodge. So I, I just would love to figure out more about lust. And um, mm. so I guess mm. it, it's a big topic, but like, um, what right. what do you think that most people don't understand about lust? Like, what's a common misunderstanding that you see? Uh huh. Yeah. Great question. Um, so, um, it, um, I feel very called to this this topic of lust, um, and I kind of feel like there's two half truths that that are kind of out there. So, um, you have more of this like religious community uh, half truth. And so church culture often that uh, really stands upon the foundation of living for a higher purpose and morality, incredibly important. And it's something, it's like a half truth that is really needed for the other side, which I'll say is, is more like the secular community um, but the, the half truth that the secular community is really standing on is uh, uh, love. And it's this really beautiful, like, we are not ashamed of you. You can be ho like holy yourself, everything about you. You can be authentic to yourself and we love and accept you. And this is incredibly important too. And something that I think more the church communities really need to learn from uh this, this, um, unconditional grace. Um, so, and that's, and that's just kind of generalizing, but I feel like what I want to do is kind of marry these half truths, because if you're standing in just the half truth of, uh, uh, of grace and love and acceptance, that is so great. But the pitfall is that there could be a lack of discernment. And so what I mean like that, by that is, um, so I watched a lot of gay porn and there are people who really think that the only way I can become happy is to divorce my wife and find a boyfriend. And that is the only way that I'm going to become happy. Um, and, and I know it's rubbish, but it, it's, it's, um, it's convincing. It's, it's kind of a common, it's a kind of a common thought and and um sure. you know when when people tell that to me i i, act, I get pretty angry because i think you know you have no idea what you're talking about and you don't know me. um but hmm. but it makes sense why why they you know they may feel this way uh because the reality is is that there are a lot of um men who have cheated on their wives and decided to get a boyfriend um so which brings me to want to talk about the other half truth, which is if you stand upon morality and living for a higher purpose, this is great. But uh, the pitfall that I see is a denial, like denying a part of myself. Yeah. Mm. And I think that this is why there are all these stories on the internet about the man who marries the woman and then, you know, like hides his, you know, gay porn from her. And then at some point just can't take it anymore. And, you know, their marriage explodes. Um, yeah. And it's terribly sad. Um, but it's, it's this, 
I, I think it's this denial of, um, of a part of themselves that, uh, you know, you can only deny your feelings for so long before they just simmer and bubble up and kind of burst out. And, yeah. and you know, I, I've heard many stories. Sometimes they burst out and it's ugly. Um, oh, yeah. Well, especially so, when there's kids involved. So I feel like, right. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think, um, it, um, what, what I would like to do is actually bring both half truths together and have it so that we can live moral lives, distinguishing what is good and what's really not good. Um, mm -hmm. this is incredibly important, but also to honor our whole selves and be truly sure. authentic. And that's, I mean, I think that's incredibly important too. Well, there's so much nuance that gets trounced upon in our society because you're asked, in many ways, you're forced to choose a side of an incomplete conversation. So you have to side with one or the other, either the religious perspective or the secular perspective. And oftentimes neither one have been fully elucidated or elaborated upon. And so you have to agree with something that doesn't quite really make sense if you dig deep enough because there's a lot missing. And that nuance mm -hmm. is the, so in the, the religious, and we talk a lot about this, we have a talk about, you know, your relationship with your ideals. And a lot of times if somebody's just living by their ideals, um, but they're not doing it, they're just doing it with their body, but not with their heart and their mind because it's hard for them to buy into it. Then they form a very dysfunctional relationship with their ideals and they might be living a religious life per se, but they're internally just rotting. And at some point that's going mm -hmm. to become a very big problem. And in many cases, they'll end up blaming mm -hmm. their ideals for their problems. Oh, it's stupid religion is like, and you see this online all the time. I used to right, be this. Right. I thought it was just mm -hmm. our church, mm -hmm. you know, like ex Moonies, this kind of thing. But <laughs> when you dig deep, it's actually, there's ex Catholics, ex Mormons, ex Christians, there's ex atheists, right. there's ex right. uh, Republicans, yeah. ex liberal. It's everybody who uses the external measurement of that thing that they belong to as their identity, but they do it without fully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm understanding it or, or doing it with their, their heart and that, but then conversely, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what you're talking about with the, um, full grace and acceptance, uh, this idea of like, we love you unconditionally is not sincere either because, um, like you see this happens in porn all the time. You see, well, it's consenting adults having sex and then on its surface, mm -hmm. you can't argue that because they are consenting adults. But then when you get into, well, what is consent? Because many of these people mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. traumatized. Are they consenting mm -hmm. with their traumatic right. selves, their right. traumatized selves, mm -hmm. or their better judgment? Are they on drugs mm -hmm. and just trying to feed themselves and they're consenting with their addiction? Mm -hmm. Like well, mm -hmm. consent right. is actually, there's a lot of nuance that we used to appreciate in society, but now... We want even kids to have consent. Just by the way, I, I found mm -hmm. out that in mm -hmm. Canada, in British Columbia, they're pushing for, in the province of British Columbia, pushing for kids to be able to consensually, like as a kid, you could say, I want fentanyl, and they could be granted fentanyl without their parents' knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that a kid mm -hmm. could get access to a highly addictive drug because they consented to it, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kids have always been protected from consent right. because they can't consent because they don't have a prefrontal cortex. They don't have the ability to judge well. So yeah, anyway, both of mm -hmm. these sides right. lack the nuance of this conversation that's very usually generalized. And, and it's pretty sad because right. a lot of victims end up feeling forced. Like you said, if you didn't really dig deep into this topic, you you would maybe have guilt issues like, why am I married and with kids when I should really be living my authentic self when that's not necessarily your authentic self. That's 
a version of your identity that was born out of trauma and pain and stuff that you've unpacked mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, right. there's so much nuance that gets lost and murdered. Honestly, nuance right. is getting murdered in our society. It's a crime. Yeah. It, it, and I know I, because I'm like working with more and more people, I hear more and more stories and there's so much consensual sex that is so damaging to their mm. spirit. Um, do you want to unpack that so, a little bit? I yeah, mean, it's generally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, I I've heard a lot of sexual abuse stories and it's like consensual, but there's grooming and manipulation and, um, you know, they, you know, that cliche hurt people, hurt people. It's like yeah. this cycle of abuse. Like the abuser ends up abusing other people and then you have all these other abused people, but it's like, because they got abused by an abuser, it's, it's feeding into their lust. And now they, they, they get a kick out of being the abuser. Um, tragic, you know, it's this vicious cycle. And um, I, I just, I just know a lot of people who are, who are devastated um, yeah. So, so, so without getting into details, I do want to mention, it's just something that I've never said publicly, but uh, I used to live in, uh, North Hollywood, which at that time was, I heard, uh, the porn production capital of the entire world. It was in the Valley, you know, mm. the San, uh, the Valley of, of kind of Los Angeles area. And I had a coworker, I worked at like a PO box place and the coworker was a, a big part of the, the gay scene out there. And he was proudly gay, but he would go to these parties that there were sex parties. And he was even mortified by the fact that, you know, they'd be, they'd be having these, um, I don't want to get into details, but basically people could observe uh -huh. each other in the act of sex. And there were many, uh -huh. he uh -huh. was disturbed by the amount of people that were replaying their childhood sexual abuse publicly for other people to see. And uh -huh. even him uh -huh. at that time was like, yeah. I, this is yeah. really messed up. And I see it all the time. I don't understand it. And so mm -hmm. it's, mm. It needs to be unpacked, right? Like the fact that so many people when they're sexually abused become sexually abusers, abusers needs to be understood. And the fact mm -hmm. that porn now yes. is considered in many circles sexual abuse, how do you think that factors into your childhood, right? The fact that you're watching some very heinous scenarios as a child, that's no kid should be, be exposed to that. That's a form of abuse because mm -hmm. you're being exposed to something that mm -hmm. you shouldn't be, that it you, is. that's too big mm -hmm. for you. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so how do you think that's going to play out in your future if you've been sexually abused? You got to look out for that and understand it, mm -hmm. essentially. Right. Right. If, if we cannot transform our trauma, we will transmit it. It's like inevitable. Ooh, I've never heard that. Is that a is that like a saying, or did he just coin that? <laughs> uh, I I took it from Jay Stringer. Um, okay, but I feel I I really like Jay Stringer. He's he he talks about a generational character as someone who can who's willing to metabolize as much generational toxins and poison as they can, so that future generations don't have to deal with it. Um, so beautiful. And so I feel like my job is to do my, like do my healing work so that my kids get to stand on, um, a higher platform. Um, yeah, that's my hope. Got it. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so you are standing on this foundation where you've done a lot of work you understand more the inner workings of your own SSA journey. And we've talked about that in, in the previous podcast episode, mm -hmm, but right. one thing that at that time, when I interviewed you, you hadn't studied, um, to the same extent as you now understand, mm -hmm. which is right. lust at yes. large and how, how lust is fueled and, mm. yes. and what is this thing? Yes. So I, I really want to unpack this, this thing. I don't know how to go about it. Lead the way. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I'd love to, to dig into my story. Um, okay. And I feel like, um, so uh, going back to these kind of two half truths, I feel like there is our spirituality and there is our humanity. And I think God's not ashamed of either of these aspects of us. Um, and so I think what's, what's been my journey is actually how to honor mostly my humanity. Um, and that's especially recently been my journey. And, um, and so I'd love to, to share a bit um, about that. So maybe I'll start with something that happened recently. Um, so I was, so I haven't watched porn in nine years. So I, you know, gay porn does not have a, a draw to me anymore. And, um, uh, I haven't, uh, fantas fantasized and masturbated for six years. So it's, that actually also doesn't have a, a big draw. Um, so, um, but, um, having said all of that and having, you know, been married for, uh, four years and having a lot of beautiful, um, moments with my wife and having a lot of, uh, beautiful times where, where we've had sex. Um, I was, uh, at a men's retreat in, uh, the spring last spring. And I noticed that someone was bending over and their, the, this guy's underwear was, uh, poking out. And so I, I, I just noticed it and it was white underwear. And I noticed that that caused arousal for me. And so I'm, I'm feeling kind of like ashamed of this. Like I, I should be over this. I have a great wife. She's pretty like, why, why is this like some guy bending over arousing me and causing me to do a double take? Um, and, um, we, uh, later end up in, well, it, it's, it's pretty cold. We're in Idaho and it's cold and, um, we we're wearing pants in the morning, but when the sun comes out, it actually got quite warm. So, you know, we're all changing into shorts and I noticed that he's, I walk into a room where he's undressing and I noticed that he's wearing white underwear, but he's not wearing white briefs. And so suddenly the arousal disappeared. And so I just looked at that and I got kind of curious about it. And I thought, okay, what, um, what's really going on here? There was some sort of um, arousal around this prospect that he might be wearing white briefs. So this takes me back to when I was 13. I was living in Korea by myself. My parents weren't there. I was doing um, the GOP program. Um, I'm not sure if they even still have that, but I was doing the GOP yeah, program in Korea and there were, oh, the, okay, look at that. Um, there were 11 other boys and it's early on in the year and I'm just trying to like fit in and belong. And, you know, these are, these are my 11 other brothers, right? Supposedly that I want to make friends with. And they're all making friends with each other. And I'm like wanting to, to kind of fit in. Um, it's, uh, when I went to Korea, I packed only white briefs. It wasn't, in, and it didn't strike me as anything like weird about that until I actually got to Korea and boys would talk about tidy whities in a derogatory way and make fun of them. And obviously they weren't cool, uh, to wear. So I became kind of paranoid. I didn't want anyone to see me in my underwear because I'm just trying to fit in and obviously yeah. they're not cool. Um, and so I walk into this room and there's four boys and I'm kind of rigid and uncomfortable trying to laugh along um, with someone's crude joke. And then a bigger boy gets behind me without me noticing. And the next thing I know, he pulls my pants down and my tidy whities are exposed. I'm exposed. Um, and I can't help but feel like I should have outgrown them. 
And I feel so like a just little boy. A, a wave, a tsunami of shame and embarrassment, like face bright red, that kind of feeling. Yeah, hu like hu humiliated. I felt humiliated. Uh, but but here's the kicker. So I, I pull my pants up and um, I, I'm kind of proud of past Gene. I actually tried to smack the kid in the face. Um, but when I smacked him, he's a bigger kid and he's fast. He grabs my hand and he smiles. And I just know I'm not going to be able to get this guy back. No justice is going to be had. And I end up freezing and I just flop like a rigid board onto the nearest bed. And I just lay there, like my face smushed into my pillow uh, for hours. Hmm. Um, I felt uh, weak and pathetic. And this goes back to, if anyone's listened to my other podcast, when I was seven years old, pretty much the exact same thing happened. I got my pants pulled down by my siblings and they put a diaper on me. And I felt like a baby. Um, and I felt like a baby my, because my brother always called me a crybaby. He'd always make me cry. And, and so I have this theme of like being a baby, being this little boy. Um, and I, you know, am I surprised that it took me so long to actually claim that I am a man? I, I was okay being a guy, a dude, but I never felt like a man, sure. um, as an, as an adult. Um, not until I, I did a retreat where I finally claimed my manhood and I think I was 26. Um, so it took me 26 years, um, to, to finally like claim my manhood. Um, but when I look at this story, this humiliation, when I was 13 years old, it was one of my earliest times masturbating and I masturbated into the tidy whities that I was so ashamed of and I soiled them. And this became a ritual for me uh, to always masturbate into white briefs. Um, and something I never really thought about as an adult, but when I looked back, I thought that's kind of weird that it's always like tidy whities And I'd even like, like type in tidy whitey stuff when I looked for porn, that was always more arousing um, than just men's underwear. and. It caused so much embarrassment because, you know, like this is just such a weird fetish. Um, men's underwear is weird enough, but tidy whities that's just really like embarrassing. I, I was too embarrassed to even too. say it in the previous podcast. Right. Mm. Um, and so when I, when I uh, look, look at the story and, and when I, you know, I feel like a story collector in many ways, I just talk to many people, hear their stories. It's, it's very common for, fetishes to develop in this like puberty time um, and for things to become sexualized. And for me, that feeling weak and pathetic and being humiliated totally got sexualized. And so my mm. fantasies were always me, me being humiliated or if I was angry, me humiliating someone else by putting them in white briefs. I kid you not. I would, I would, oh, I did this for, for, you know, all the time that I struggled with um, uh, sexual fantasy and not to say that I, I don't struggle with it now. It's just uh, not as frequent before, before I was like, you know, it almost felt like every hour I would have just constant thoughts of um, sexual fantasy. And mm. it, and it, it made me really like concerned, like about my sexuality and like, you know, I like it, it was it was um so foggy for me like I just didn't understand Hey, just a quick interruption to tell you about the 40 day high noon challenge. If you're trying to find a way to start living a high noon life today with no shadows and create a radiant blessing, then this simple challenge is for you. We will send you daily lessons from our team that will keep you motivated on your journey. It's totally free guys and you'll get constant content directly to you. Just sign up today at highnoon.org slash challenge. I just like to interject here because there's a few, there's a couple things that really stand out. And mm -hmm. one is the idea of sexual imprinting. And we've mm -hmm. touched on that 
on this podcast before, but like when animals are born, there's certain animals that the first thing they see, they think it's their mom and it could be a car. Mm -hmm. It could be anything, <laughs> you know? Right. And that's how you can train ducks to like follow you anywhere you go because certain ducks, they, they imprint. But when we're in our formative years, right around pubescence, and we start to sexualize things. We start to imprint that as that is our, that's like our sexual template. That's what we expect is normal. Mm -hmm. That's what we think we want. And it's all being fed to us by our environment. And we're meant to be saved from that. We're Honestly, that, that time of our life should be reserved for uh, like not being spoon fed images and culture and all this th that's sexual because it's feeding us all the wrong ideas. Um, we're meant to talk about this with our parents, to be honest, we're meant to figure this out together in a holistic, healthy way with the people in our environment rather than sorting it out through ourselves and our immaturity and just assuming that I feel so therefore I am right. Which is kind of, this generation, I feel this, therefore I am this. It's it it can go mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very deep, run into in terms of your identity. But also in right. tandem with that kind of sexual imprinting, there's I just revisited the book Iron John, which talks about the mm. for thousands of years, humanity had a process for children to turn into adults. And it was always around right. 13. Right. And it was tribal mm -hmm. and they all had different processes. Some mm -hmm. of them were kind of violent, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. There'd be an elder mm -hmm. that would mm -hmm. like punch the kids in the face um, and their blood would be like, don't forget that life is fragile. You're a man now. You're not just a kid, you know, um, which I don't necessarily consent to at all on any level. But the point is that there is always some ritual of a child around pubescence turning into a man in the case of a boy or, or girls turning into women. And there would always be elders involved because they are the men. They, they're the ones teaching mm -hmm. you how to be a man. Right. And in our right. society, since we don't have these processes, the way that kids learn how to be like boys learn how to be men is from now TikTok or porn or Marvel movies or whatever. And they're creating this image that's all based on, fantasy and fear and like all these weird emotions that they haven't sorted through. And they're now starting to cement that as this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I'm attracted to. This is what a woman should be and should look like, or men should be. So they're formulating all this opinion, but completely absent or devoid of a conversation with somebody who's in a stable marriage or stable position who can help them sort through all this stuff. Cause like you said, it's like a bunch of have truths put into a soup. How do you sort through the ingredients when it's all in a, in a soup of like, there's now good ingredients and there's poison now in this soup. You cannot just have a sip of that soup and assume that you're not sipping poison. So, that's so much of our sexual template is born of this confused perspective that we had to figure out by ourselves because our parents didn't talk to us about sex and all this stuff. And so um, you had to go through all this really confusing, really strong, like it was fueled by emotions, you know, this replaying of your trauma through lust, which is so weird, but it's mm -hmm. so human. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't right. believe animals do this. I've never heard of like, you know, dolphins uh, having sex with rocks because they're angry or with other species or anything like that out of emotional need. But humans associate sex and lust to hatred or resentment or all this. And it's so unhealthy. But now, not only is it accepted, but it's marketed to you in the form of a genre specifically tailor-made for your lust, right? So now with the a la carte porn, there's like revenge porn and all this stuff that's fueled by super unhealthy emotions. And now your natural desire to want to connect through sex is associated heavily with these 
really super negative emotions that will never produce intimacy, which is the purpose of sexuality. So it's just a messy mm. thing that needs to be sorted through. Right. I, I agree. It needs to be sorted through. Um, I, um, you said, I feel, therefore I am, and I definitely can get that. And I feel like the, I feel therefore I am is on one side and the other side is, um, uh, you know, ignore those feelings because that's not yeah. who you are. Um, but sick. I actually think that there's, it's actually somewhere in between, um, mm -hmm. where, where we need to be, um, sure. not because I, I mean, um, I know uh, plenty of men who are kind of in a similar situation as me, they experience same, same sex attraction and desires for gay porn. And they're told to, well, just ignore that or just pray that away. And this is actually really problematic because that that desire is there for a reason. And the desire sure. is good. If you believe that um, evil cannot create on its own, but evil has to latch onto good and twist goodness, mm -hmm. then you know that that means you actually have to untwist your lust. You actually have to untwist the evil, untwist the perversion but you need to keep that thread of goodness that's there. And um, for, for me, I think a lot of that desire that was pushing me to gay porn was this desire to be free, this desire to be wild and free. And as a, as a little boy who was shy and a peacemaker and a rule follower, that was so important. And it makes so much sense to me that I kept going back to gay porn because this was my chance to be wild and free and break all the rules. Um, and so I actually feel like in honoring that part of me, I actually find that that desire gets satiated in a healthy way because it really isn't about sex. And so I get to hold my spirituality and my humanity and I, I think that I think can you please so unpack cool. that. So just because you were reiterating points that you had made, but I just want to make sure because this is when words mm. semantics are important. Cause I, I agree with you. I believe, uh, wholeheartedly that the desire, but when you're talking about desire, you're talking about to be wild and free. This is you're not talking about sexually at adolescence. I believe what you're talking mm -hmm. about is just the mm -hmm. general desire to be, to be adventurous as a kid, meaning to go out yes. into yes. the forest without socks or to go, I don't know, <laughs> snow, snowboarding or something like that. But in the absence right. of a yeah. hel healthy exactly. outlet for that adventure with other guys, right? To go on adventures right. with other guys is like such yes. a, a, a deep need yes. that we all have yeah. it gets it gets twisted and congealed uh together with sex is that what you're saying right so so my sexual fantasies around men or men's underwear has diminished significantly however it will come up and when it comes up i always get really curious and i think okay what's what's it that my that it, my you know, my spirit, my body really needs, and it's trying to communicate through, you know, these, these thoughts. Um, and so then I'll, you know, like w one time I just, I went camping with uh, a bunch of my, my friends, right. My guy friends. And, you know, and we, we uh, become mildly egreg egregious and um, swear a bit. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll go, you know, sh you know, uh, sh stripped of my underwear and jump in the lake. Um, and this, like, honoring this, like, wild freedom side of me, w while, uh, while also honoring my spiritual core and my marriage to my wife, um, it, it totally satiates, like, my, my whole being. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important. Yeah. We, we have that other brother that, you know, I don't know if he wants to be called out. So I'm not, I'm, who also has SSA, mm -hmm. uh, 
um, tendencies. And he was saying too, that when he, when his, when his brotherhood, um, sense of like the need to belong to a brotherhood when that's fulfilled his longing for sexualizing men is completely diminished it's squashed because he's filled mm -hmm. up yes what he actually is looking for is connection to men and when he's not getting it through natural means meaning spending quality time with men hugging men uh you know mm -hmm. as as brothers mm -hmm. and as uncles or whatever uh he has zero sexual lust for men but when he's mm -hmm. isolated mm -hmm. from the experience of manhood his desire to sexualize men is stronger right, right? and he's also blessed right. so um it's something honestly because not a lot of people uh, who listen to this uh struggle with ssa everybody's interested to understand it for sure but this also applies to complete heterosexuals as well right which is like yes Yes. You're, you're yes. longing to sexualize or to experience sex through porn, especially is just in the absence of natural, healthy connections, either to parents, to people of the other gender, people of the same gender, you're, you're starved for something natural and you're willing to substitute that with something toxic, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that satiated my you know, by cravings, what I would have called my sexual cravings, but in hindsight, it was, you know, it, it was deeper than sex. It was like deep yearnings of my heart was when I um, was held by a father figure and he held me for 10 minutes and I was just in his arms crying and uh, crying for like 10 minutes straight. And after it, I felt like this emotional release I felt lighter and like my, those sexual desires just felt like fulfilled, you know, even though it was it, cause it wasn't actual, actually sexual, um, you know, yeah. arousal isn't actually, it doesn't have to be sexual. Um, but we always think, oh, if I'm aroused, it's sexual, but it's, it, you know, there are many things that can arouse our senses and our emotions. And our feelings. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Stress. I, I do want to say, <laughs> sorry. Stress. Yeah. Um, well, I do, I do want to say, because we talked about emotions and you talked about negative emotions. I actually feel, um, strongly about this area too, that, that like anger porn, anger is a huge driver for porn. And I feel like it's, and it's really only been like the last season of my life where I've really been trying to work on my relationship with my anger. And the more like I try to create harmony with my anger and untangle my anger from like evil twisting its way around it, um, the more I feel like uh, my anger gets to be used instead of mm. denied. And this goes back yeah, to what, yeah. what I was talking earlier about be denying our feelings um, it doesn't work and denying my anger didn't work. For and sure. so now I feel like my honor, I get to honor my anger and it no longer becomes like, uh, sexual, like, like, uh, rape sexual fantasies, which is, is common. Um, oh, and, yeah. um, <laughs> um, I mean, they did meta analysis like, of porn and, the terms used were overwhelmingly in favor of pejorative, negative, denigrating mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. So they never, yes. you never yes. see porn where somebody's like, Hey, I love, I love you so much. It's like, they're insulting each uh -huh. other yes. because it's all about yes. dominance and aggression. And so, yeah, to be honest, I just had, you know, I've been going to acupuncture. I found a really good guy close to where I'm living presently. And he said, I hold a lot of stress in me and I just need to scream more into my pillow or do something like that. And I realized that a, a key outlet that I had in my formative years for my aggression was skateboarding. Like there's a lot that comes with skateboarding. There's there's a type of music, punk ska music that you just, you just dance like crazy and you get all this like young boy aggression uh -huh. out. Uh -huh. Skateboarding is you just pummel your body with gravity and you fight uh -huh. against gravity and it's like this epic battle 
Um, but this is also a massive problem, not just in your formative years, but especially as you become sedentary as an adult, um, that men's men have all sorts of crises, women too, that arise from not getting that energy out. And so like getting out into the world mm -hmm. as often as you need to and go to the gym and just like, you know, lift some heavy stuff or go and, and there's aggression in us. And like you said, it's not bad. It's, it can be used for productive means for sure. But if you then start mm -hmm. to tie in sexuality to these strong emotions, then that's when it becomes really confusing and painful and hurtful for sure. Right. And that's, that's why I think it's, it's, it's like that. I think curiosity is really key. Like what can I untangle here and what's really mm. good here um, yeah. so that that good can be held onto and honored. Um, it, it's, it's so important. I think our lust is, is revealing something so important, a neglected desire that we're deprived of. And so we've got to like dig into the lust and kind of thank the lust. Like, thank you for, for giving me red flags that I'm depriving myself of something because we fantasize about something we want that we don't have. Right. So do you have any ways of doing that? Because that's something I've been advising people, especially in the past, maybe six months that when they are feeling sexually aroused and they're noticing the desire to want to reach out for their phones or the, for their computers or whatever, it's like, it's mm -hmm. a sign that there's, it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. There's, there's mm -hmm. a physical mm -hmm. need or an emotional or a spiritual need that is trying to express itself. And the only way that it feels mm -hmm. it's going right. to get your attention is if you go about it in right. a certain way, it's like a needy child. And it, it, needy children <laughs> will get attention any way that they know how, that you've trained them is acceptable. And same with these emotional needs. If you've trained anger to only be addressed through porn, then you might be reaching out for porn when, when really you just need to mm -hmm. go for a walk or you need to talk to somebody about you because you have anger stuff. But there's, do you have any anything that you advise people to do when they are experiencing lust in an unnatural way to kind of dig at and figure out mm -hmm. what the emotion underlying emotion is? Yeah. So I think the more that you know your story, the more clear it will be what this lust is trying to reveal. I see. Lust is often just a reenactment of wounding. And I find that, you know, different lust will come about. Like sometimes my lust will pull me back to when I was seven years old. Sometimes my lust will pull me back to when I was 15 years old. Um, and I think it's important to know where we are in our story. And um, to when we can like find that. So the question that you can ask is, is, you know, how are you feeling? Okay, are you feeling anger? Are you feeling, it's it's usually more than just loneliness. It's, you know, is there anger? Is there, um, you're feeling defeated? And then ask, how old is that feeling? And then whatever thoughts are going in your head, how old is that? Like, I for me, uh, I'm an F up. Uh, you know, I, I can, uh, look back to that. I've been saying that for a long time. Um, and that's, that's shame and shame, I think is the thing that we really need to be looking to sniff out because shame is, is a huge driver for porn. Um, uh, the Jay Stringer did a research study, uh, found that shame was way, a way bigger driver than, um, like the desire for pleasure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's crazy. So I mean, I, I identify. I, sorry, there's a bit of a sorry, lag here. It's the what's crazy is the thing that fuels the porn economy is not the desire 
to seek after pleasure, but rather the need to escape shame and pain. Think about that. Think about that one framing that we view, you know, like Hollywood is fueled by a, a nice light escape from life. You, you know, you go to watch a movie and, you know, this kind of thing. And at its best, that's, that's kind of what it does. It does some destructive stuff, but let's just leave it like that. But the porn entire industry mm-hmm. is fueled not by our longing to play around and to be fun and to be free, but rather by a deep underlying need to escape our horrid lives. <laughs> Think about that. That's what fuels this entire yeah. industry. Yeah, it, it's it's insane, and it's 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 a funny paradox because it's it's escaping, but it's also like almost like uh, punishing. Like uh, I, I when I would feel really crummy about myself, I would go to porn so that I could really like feel like my my shame and yeah. put myself down. So it's like when a dog pees on the floor and you rub his face in the pee, except you are the dog and you're rubbing your own face and your own pee just so that you can feel worse about your life. Something like that. Yeah. It, if you, you know, when I really uh, think about it and I've been reading different authors, shame is essentially the uh, arch enemy of God and goodness. Oh, wow. Shame is is essentially like, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of God's love. I'm not worthy of goodness. Um, and so I feel like, like deeper than sexuality, our job in, you know, for, for our personal journey and walking this journey with other people is to really sniff out shame, like, Mm -hmm. like take out shame so that it can be exposed for the lie that it is. Yeah. So that's a great exercise is to look at the areas. So there's dogs that are trained to find those truffle, you know, those mushrooms that are really expensive in Mm -hmm. France. They go out into the forest Mm -hmm. and these mushrooms are really expensive. So they go and they sniff out these things. We need our own kind of internal dogs that can sniff out where in our lives are we ashamed and start talking about those things in the right context, right environment in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. therapist or in your high noon group or wherever you think is appropriate, somebody close mm-hmm. to you that mm-hmm. you feel can handle. Mm-hmm. And talking about the things that you're ashamed of takes away the power that the shame has. That's the whole thing that shame yes. seeks to do yes, is to separate yes. you from people. And because we're powerful as a human species when we're connected and shame is the darkness that seeks to make sure that we're all separated from that power, from that collective power, that we're all Mm -hmm. sitting Mm -hmm. in isolation, Mm -hmm. hating ourselves rather than letting each other know how beautiful we are. And so Mm -hmm. to be able Mm -hmm. to have that skill set is kind of, I guess I would say in this this modern era is one of the top five skills you need in order to survive this modern world is to understand where your shame is coming from and learning how to talk about it in a healthy mm-hmm. way so that you don't try to escape it. Cause otherwise you'll end up with a variety of issues that you don't understand eating problems, procrastination, mm-hmm. right. porn, resentment, all this stuff that's all coming from a place of shame. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll add that I thought I was like done with shame and like, oh yeah, shame. Oh yeah. I'm, I know that's a bad thing. I'm not ashamed. Um, but the more I dig into my story, the more I realize that, oh no, there's, there's actually more shame and the nature of shame is to like hide from us. So, um, anyways, I just mentioned that because I, I talked to a lot of people and they're like, oh yeah, I get that. I get that. You know, I'm not, you know, I know I shouldn't be ashamed when I have a relapse. Um, but the shame yeah. is deep and our bodies yeah. know it because our bodies will respond to the shame. Yeah. 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 yeah that's super important. We, we, it's, we all have it to some degree where we have, um, shame of, you know, when you get to a certain age, so I'm in my forties. So there's like this idea of like, I should be at a certain place in life and that runs deep. Mm-hmm. Like that impacts some decisions. A lot of people, 
Like I'm actually at the age when people start having midlife crises. Think about that. Mm. And my <laughs> wife yeah, even yeah. noticed certain patterns that I was being really hard on myself and all this stuff. She's like, honey, are you starting to have a midlife crisis? <laughs> and I was just like, well, I'm technically, it depends on how well these ne the next half goes. I might be at the midpoint of my life and I'm not sure that I, that I've lived a fulfilling life that I've done everything that I was born to do. And like, when uh -huh, you uh -huh. can take that and use it as fuel in a healthy way to do great things, or you can use that to like my friend's dad, when we were in high school, his dad wrote a letter. He had, it was two kids and a wife They had a house, they had a life. Steady Eddie wrote a letter, said, you guys knew this was coming for a while. I'm living now with my secretary. And so he left his family. He, he bleached his hair. He bought a convertible and he started wearing Hawaiian shirts. And it was like by the book cliche midlife crisis. And like that was uh -huh, uh -huh. something that was growing in him for a while. So there's now quarter life uh -huh. crises for people, you know, around 25 right. that they're yeah. meant, they, their yeah. crisis is I should have it all figured out. I should have a career path. I should know. But now there's high school crises. There's middle school crises. There's all this stuff that. The only way that you can get through those is by understanding what are you afraid of and what are you ashamed of, talking to people about it, and mm -hmm. then, and then moving. Don't stop. Keep moving forward, right? But together with other people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, wounding happens when within relationships that break down. So healing happens. I I keep hearing this, and I, I'm inclined to believe it healing happens in relationships that go yes. right. Yes. Um, yes. So I, I'm, I, I'm with you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, we do need to end soon. We're like right at the hour, but I wanted to unpack, mm -hmm. uh, you started to talk about lust and then you started talking about your desire you know, the positive aspect of like your desire to want to run wild and just be, be kind of carefree as, as a young person. And so are you saying that, um, lust isn't necessarily even sexual? It's like a lust for a longing. Is that what you're saying? Or like, what is, what is the healthy version of lust? Because you mentioned that before we started recording that there's a desire to want to unpack like the healthy version of lust. And I can't say that I know what that would be. Because in my understanding of lust, it's mm -hmm. a it's mm -hmm. a negative word. It's like a longing to escape. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you know something different, right. I'm I'm open to hearing that. Well, if lust is negative, it has to latch on to something good. So that yearning is is a good yearning, right? And so I see. Uh, like my yearning for a father figure that would hold me. Okay. I didn't even know that I wanted that until the opportunity presented itself. And now I'm like, oh yeah, I need, I, I totally needed that. Sure. Okay. So the less that you're talking about, I, I, again, semantics are important, um, is like a yearning or a longing for something. And it's, imperative for your sanity and for your well-being to understand the yearning the signal that's being broadcast mm -hmm. because just like that broken telephone game it's like the signal is hey i i want i want like a mother figure to say you're not a complete screw up that you're a good guy and that god loves mm -hmm. you and mm -hmm. then that gets mm -hmm. broken down into i need to go watch porn because you've just completely mm -hmm. misunderstood the signal right so to understand the, the broadcasting signal of what the, the longing is, and it's some most likely emotional fundamental need, which is a need to connect to God, mm -hmm. to connect to yourself, to connect to nature, mm -hmm. to connect mm -hmm. to people, a mother figure, father figure, sister figure, brother figure, younger brother figure. I just realized lately that I'm restoring in my own life the elder brother position because I've always been everybody's younger brother. Mm -hmm just because of my nature and how I dress and look like everybody, even people half my age treat me like I'm younger than them because I act like it. But there's like a need to, to play different roles and to fill those. So like 
a younger brother, younger sister, like all this needs to be understood. And, and, uh, that makes sense to me. Is that, is that what you're saying or have I, have I morphed it? Yeah, pretty much. So if, you know, if you think porn is reenacting our trauma, Mm. the trauma is where we didn't get, you know, like those foundational needs. And so we're left desiring them, yearning for them. Oh. Ideally, we would have just gotten them. We just would have had, you know, these great parents that were like, you know, embodying God's love every moment of the day and could carry us and see us and attune to us and ask us, you know, how are you really doing and hold us. Um, but, you know, our parents um, will miss us and our siblings are obviously not perfect. And so we end up having these uh, uh, these wounding experiences where we don't yeah. get something. And so now we're yearning for it. Yeah. 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 That's, that's incredible. Cause think about that. Like how many people have fully fleshed out functional relationships with other brothers and other sisters and how many of us have just, especially with the opposite gender, a complete lack of awareness and our experience with them you know, as a guy in high school that you're like, women are a mystery and they're just scary. And like, that's only because they're unfamiliar and you haven't formed healthy bonds. Women shouldn't be scary at all if you're a man and, or if you're a, some women experience that other women are intimidating to them or whatever. So yeah, that that's really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is understanding the longing. And a lot of times that longing mm -hmm. is mm -hmm for something that uh, a natural need that's gone unmet either for a long period of time or just even more recently, just like a cup that needs filling up. You need a little bit more sibling time or a little bit more, you know, parental figure time or whatever. Yeah, that it makes sense, man. Yeah, this has been productive. Thank you. Um, I do feel the need to wrap up, uh, but there's definitely more gene to come uh, because genes uh -huh. slowly emerging into our world. Um, and we're going to be collaborating with them a bunch. Uh, details to come soon for those of you in the know. Um, but yeah, thank you, Gene, for stopping by. This is, this is informative. And is there anything else that you feel like we didn't unpack that you'd like to have one last opportunity to just kind of express before we go? Hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I, I really appreciate Peter Levine's definition for trauma. Uh, trauma is not what happens to us, but it's what happens inside of us in the absence of an empathetic listener. Hmm. Um, so, so the, the need to almost get that healing done in the presence of an empathetic listener is really important. So I just want to encourage people to not try to DIY your recovery, but <laughs> walk with community. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. Plugged into a group, so, you know, find support. Yeah. Great advice. Somebody who can be committed to you, after you confess because or th that you express yourself and then that's not the end of the conversation because a lot of people their only experience with mm -hmm. revealing what what's going on inside of them is at a camp or whatever they feel good in the moment but then there's no follow-up there's nothing after mm -hmm. that so it can even be mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. even worse because you felt like you touched heaven and now you're deeper in hell because you're by yourself so yeah great point do this in groups and communities. Um, yeah, thanks, Gene. You're the man. Appreciate you and all that you do. Thanks for having me, we'll be Andrew. swinging back around. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you know that our team wants to do more events? Well, if you want to bring the High Noon message to your community or group, then let us know and we'll try to work something out. There's a simple application that you can fill out right now at highnoon.org slash invite. And one of our team members will get back to you to see what's possible. That's highnoon.org slash invite. All right, see you in the next episode.